Hi everyone, welcome to the IoT Hero Show, my weekly showcase of thought leadership on the Internet of Things. My name is Tom Raftery, I'm the Global IoT Evangelist for SAP, and now, on with the show. Hey everyone, welcome to the IoT Hero Show. My name is Tom Raftery, I'm Global IoT Evangelist for SAP, and with me on the show today I have Marcus, and I think Marcus, your surname is Torche, is that how I'm pronouncing it, or that is how I'm pronouncing it, is that how it should be pronounced? That, that's correct, Tom, thanks. Okay, Mar <laughs> Marcus, do you want to introduce yourself, tell people what it is you do? Sure. Thanks, Tom. My name is Marcus Chorcia. I work for IDC. We are a Massachusetts uh, headquartered research firm with a global uh, footprint around the world. I'm responsible for um, the Internet of Things spending guide. It's a worldwide um, product. I am also responsible for other spending guides um, in the IDC portfolio, uh, what we refer to as innovation accelerators. And these are typically spending guides that are related to emerging uh, rapidly growing technologies. Uh, so, yeah. Cool. And Marcus, what's what's the IoT area of uh, interest to you? Because it's it's a broad area. Yeah. Uh, good question. I I've spent um, when I first started in the the Internet of Things world, quote unquote. It was really its predecessor called uh, M to M, machine to machine. And this is when I was working for uh, Nokia Research Center. Um, which was part of the Nokia Venture Organization. So it was an organization that was putting venture capital towards spin-outs, spin-ins of uh, different technology. So I, I got my feet wet um, right around 2002 is when I first uh, got involved in Machine to Machine and uh, spent the next many years on, um, on that. I cut over to um, the smart grid and energy, um, more specifically uh, emerging um, energy topics such as renewables. Um, and I did that for about six years at IDC and, and just recently have returned to the IoT uh, topic uh, full force uh, again for the past uh, year and a half. So uh, bouncing back and forth, I, I really am very much uh, interested in, in energy and, and smart grid. And, you know, I'd say first and foremost, that would probably be my, my first love with, uh, with IoT, so to speak. Super, super. I have a little bit of a background in that area myself. It's definitely an area of interest for me. So I, I think we'll have a, an interesting discussion or a great discussion around uh, energy and IoT. So smart grid is a, is a term that's been bounced around for a number of years, uh, Marcus, as you well know. Are, are, are we actually going to achieve it? Are we anywhere closer to it than we have been since, since I first started hearing about it back in 2006, 2007, 2008? Yeah, we, we we definitely are. Um, you know, when the term smart grid came about, it did not really indicate that the grid was, was quote unquote dumb in the first place. But the idea behind the smart grid, of course, is that the instrumentation of the grid with greater um, amounts of sensors and networks, specifically two-way networks that can communicate data from an edge device back to a central control authority or even a decentralized uh, authority, um, uh, you know, that, that, that notion has been around for a while. And, and you ask, have we made progress? Yeah, absolutely, we've made progress in, in the United States and across the globe. If we were to look at sort of the, you know, the poster child of what the smart grid was, and this, was, this sort of coincided uh, with, uh, unfortunately, with the financial downturn here in the United States uh, in 2008, um, we put, we, the United States, um, through ARRA funding, put a lot of money towards towards smart meters. And that really became the poster child, if you will, or certainly the public figure of investment for the smart grid. But it, it has been so much more than just smart meters. Um, you know, that's something that captures the imagination of the public because we can all relate to smart meters mounted to your house, your home, whatever it may be. But really the, you know, the, the, the big thrust of, of the smart grid um, really has taken place outside of and, and, and away from the eyes of, of consumers. And this has really taken place within the infrastructure itself. Um, everything that begins at a generation plant and generation plant can mean fossil fuel fuel or renewable energy it doesn't it doesn't really change uh, how how we uh, you know that how we how we get our 
our energy changes, but what the energy is does not really change. So um, a lot of that investment really has been taking place um, more in the distribution grid and uh, and, be- and behind, again, you know, behind the scenes, if you will, and away from the consumer's eyes. Um, so, yeah, it, it absolutely has been um, – has been cr- progressing for you know the better part of ten years now. Yeah, because um, I mean, be- before we started recording this, we had a brief conversation, you and I, and one of the things I said was that uh, for me, smart grids and IoT meant connecting everything from appliances in the home or appliances in industry right out to the generation, and. We, we, I think we're a lot closer to that now than we were, and people may not be aware of how analog the the, the infrastructure was up until now. Yeah, I, I, I generally agree. Um, you know, for the folks who are not familiar with what's taking place out there, um, you know, we've we've uh, the United States, but but also around the world, we've more or less operated what we consider to be, you know, antiquated ways of of producing electricity and and. And, and we're talking about electricity, right? But the, the smart grid, by the way, for, for folks listening, you know, it could also mean smart water. It can mean smart gas as well. Um, we've spent a tremendous amount of time because the, the benefits are, are really uh, so tremendous when we talk about electric. And, and really the, the fundamental reason for it and the difference between electric and gas and water is that electric expires immediately. Water and gas have a shelf life. You can store it. You can put it in containers. Um, you don't have to move it, so to speak. You don't have to run the pumps. But electric, as soon as it's made, it must be used or it's lost. And so there's a, a tremendous amount of balancing that goes on in the electric grid um, to convey uh, and, and, and transmit that electricity across the power lines. And, and when we talk about the, the, the grid being antiquated, it's frankly because from the point of consumption to the from the point of production um there's not a whole lot of knowledge about about what that balance needs to be in the future we use historical records we produce historically we expect that the summer heat is going to produce a spike in air conditioning usage so we produce more power um, etc but really we don't have this virtual loop and the smart grid is the idea that we will be able to at an industry level connect the consumption much more tightly to the production or we could say it the other way around in other words The way that we have been producing is that we have been producing power to chase consumption. One of the great things about the smart grid is that we can change our consumption to affect the production. And and that's a notion that's very, you know, very much at the forefront of the smart grid uh, today. And uh, how that all comes to be, uh, we're, we're still very much under development on that. So... And, and IoT is helping just because it's connecting everything together and now devices at the consumption end can see what the state of production is and vice versa. That, that, that's right. That's, a, that's exactly right. So we were mentioning earlier about the smart meter. Um, the idea behind the smart meter is that it has a connection into the home, that it is understanding what is taking place within that home. If we get further into the home and we start to develop things like home area networks and, and, and home energy management systems, things that control individual appliances. It could be a refrigerator. It could be your HVAC and heating system. It could be your car charger. But the idea that the smart meter becomes this gateway for the utilities to understand how you're using power. And it's not some kind of nefarious, you know, plan for the utilities to take over your power consumption and control your life. It's, it's, it's quite frankly, very much, uh, uh, you know, an effort to really reduce waste um, to produce power when it's needed and, and really not be wasteful. And, you know, and if, you know, there's good things that come out of it that the utilities operate more efficiently and they produce maybe some more profit, I, I think that's all beneficial as well. Um, but absolutely, the, you know, the idea behind that smart grid is that we have a, a good handle on what is being consumed at the edge of the electric network and that we can communicate that usage back to the utility so they can run their utility better smarter faster if so to speak and what about the idea as well then that uh, having two-way visibility of this information allows the utility companies to add more variable generators to the system yeah that's a it's a it's a big uh, it's a it's a big part of it um 
today when we look at renewable energy, um, renewable energy has a lot of benefits, but it also has some shortcomings. And, and one of the, the criticisms of, of intermittent renewable power, like solar, is that when clouds pass over or the sun goes down, that it's disruptive to the energy flow. It either stops it or reduces it, or when it does return, it spikes it. And the same thing could be said about wind, for example. Uh, when the wind stops blowing or slows or speeds up, it, it produces spikes um, and, and variations in, in power. And that's very different than fossil fuel that we're used to. The way that we've built the grid and, and powered the grid has been through a very, very consistent, steady flow of power production through fossil fuels, right? So we have this sort of steady, stream of, of raw material that goes into a furnace and gets fired and out comes the power. That's very different than renewables. And so to your to your question, to your, really I think to, to your point here, what you're getting at is that with intermittent sources of power, we need to be smarter, so to speak, about how we produce, uh, how, we, how we consume uh, that power and maybe even how we store that power. And as, as individuals, we're not able to manage that um, on an individual basis, just simply because we're not watching the, the clouds pass over and the wind blowing. So we really do need intelligent systems to help us manage that and having that two-way communication, understanding where power is being produced at great amounts and very inexpensively, maybe we can take advantage of that. Maybe we can, uh, maybe we can operate our homes or operate our businesses to take advantage of, of, of less expensive power when it is available and maybe that we can curtail our usage of power when it's more expensive. And, and that's really one of the fundamental tenets of the, of the smart grid when it comes to the end users is that they will be better informed and able to take advantage of those fluctuations. And, and it's really two, two sides of the same coin, right? We, we really can't take advantage of large scale um, renewable energy without having some complementary technology on, on the other end, on the consumption end of it to really balance that production. So, I mean, you mentioned earlier that you can store gas, uh, you can store water, but you can't really store electricity. But that's that's starting to change, isn't it? It is. It is. It is. Um, you know, it, it, don't let me uh, don't allow me to speak out of turn here. But yeah, we, have we been able to store energy? Yeah, we have. We, we actually we store energy in the form of of water. Um, you know, we can pump up water up to a higher elevation in a lake, and we release that through a dam and through hydro production, we can produce energy. So there's a lot of innovative ways that we can store energy. Um, or we can store what we could call a proxy to energy um, in the case of the example of water, but we haven't been able to really store raw energy in the form of batteries. And, and that is really all changing really quickly uh, right now. And we're getting down to, we're well below 200, uh, $200 um, a kilowatt um, hour um, for storage today. We will probably see in the next several years, we'll probably be below $100 per kilowatt hour. And what does that mean? What, are, what do these numbers mean? What it frankly means is it becomes more economical and it becomes possible for a utility to now deploy large-scale storage systems that can capture energy that's produced by intermittent renewable energy. And we haven't been able to do that before. The economics haven't been there. The technology has not been there. And that, that has changed. And we're rapidly coming into um, a future. California is, is very much leading the way. Um, in, in, in which we will have large scale power, um, uh, accessible to us. And, uh, this is a, it's, it's really a, it's a breakthrough. It's, it's actually a, a very much a game changer for the, for the electric utility industry. Interesting. And even when it's, when it's, when it's, when it's down below a hundred or even on, below 200, it starts to become economic for homeowners or businesses to put storage and to maybe do some energy arbitrage. Yeah, I think so. Um, so, so yes, uh, the the answer is absolutely. It, it becomes that. I think the, the question of arbitrage um, at a commercial level will really be gated by regulations uh, at the state level, at the federal level. But if we were to we, actually we don't want look at it, run. <laughs> we don't. No, no, we don't want another end run. <laughs> But to your point, though, I mean, if you've got solar panels that are sitting up on your roof, 
and you're producing power and today net metering policies and in the states like mine like in here in Massachusetts we can sell that power back to uh, to the electric company and they are required to purchase that power um, but there's also you know there's a few pennies that come off that um, so in other words even though I'm paying the equivalent of about 25 cents um, a kilowatt hour um, for that when I push it back out to the grid they're really giving me around 22 or 23 cents so I'm losing a couple of pennies so if I put storage up I actually no longer have to sell that power back out to the grid so to speak if the battery power is big enough of course uh, the battery pack is big enough and then I can I can go ahead and and save on that energy instead of me paying more uh, for the utility company to to buy their power when I'm not producing I instead have stored my own power and my own battery cells in my own home and then I can work off of that so absolutely from an individual perspective arbitrage against the pricing mechanisms of your local uh, provider is absolutely possible today at a more commercial level is that possible yes it is but that is uh, a much higher level or greater level of regulation uh, hurdles, so to speak. Sure, 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 sure. But I mean, even even if it's just uh, me with a battery on my wall or plugging in my car and using that to store energy, because the, the, uh, the, the examples everyone knows about are, I guess, the Tesla, the Tesla power wall, which is... Well, yeah. it's, it's around it's around 14 kilowatt hours or something like that between 10 and mm -hmm. 14 that kind of ballpark mm -hmm. and the tesla cars are somewhere between 17 and 100 kilowatt hours so you've got you know pretty substantial amount of storage there um but i mean if if that starts to become widespread and with with the falling prices of batteries it's going to start i suspect to to become a lot more widespread uh, then yeah, we we we, st we start to have homes and businesses which can start to be, for all intents and purposes, flywheels and and virtual power plants. Yeah, that, that's 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 absolutely a vision of the future. Um, you know the, the you know there's there's an argument uh, out there, and, and it's you know it's pretty well established that if you take it to an extreme level. Um, and I say extreme level. In other words, if the shift to decentralized power storage, uh, i.e., specifically around uh, our own homes or cars, um, the, the the disruption that could possibly happen is that there is a greater cost basis to the utility to then produce power, um, and that power prices could, in fact, actually increase even though we're we as individuals are trying to lower our cost basis or certainly trying to have at least more reliable power in the united states we've got very reliable power in the big scheme of things so i mean there, there's an argument to take in in an extreme example um that decentralization could actually hurt the utility business model and there is absolutely some truth to that um but when we actually look at it um you know the, the the argument that you're you know that you're raising or at least uh, I should say the benefit that you're raising is that you know we have all of these assets whether they're mobile in the form of electric vehicles or whether they're static storage that are mounted in say your basement or in your garage um, the, the idea that we have uh, a more resilient grid is is the very positive look. In other words, it's 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 something that that the utilities are striving for. They're striving for a more resilient grid, a grid that can withstand attacks, power outages, and disruptions. And that's something that is you know very much at the forefront of our minds, and it has been at the forefront of our minds when we think about uh, domestic terrorism or terrorism in general. So this idea of having greater distribution of assets and um, and capabilities in the form of storage and production, I, I think, is is a, is a net benefit. And these are all technologies that are doing that. And I, I think it raises a question of, you know, what are the systems that are actually going to provide uh, that intelligence, right? How do you manage this power coming on and off the grid? Mm -hmm. And these are very much big investments that utilities are making, have been making, will continue to make um, for the foreseeable future. Interesting. The, the other big factor in a lot of this that I've, I've been tracking <clears throat> is the, the, the falling, the cratering price of renewables, particularly more recently solar, but also uh, large wind. Um, 
but solar, I mean, if, if we just look at the, the pricing of the larger uh, solar power plants that are being developed more recently, we've seen in 2014, there was one in Abu Dhabi, I think it was, where the price was a record low of 5.84 cents per kilowatt hour, and that was September 2014. But by uh, early last year, uh, a price in the same region was set at something like 2.9 cents per kilowatt hour. So mm. nearly half price in, in, in 18 months. Uh, and, and that's, you know, that's a year ago. No doubt if there's another auction in the same area, it'll be lower again. Yeah, yeah, uh, th that's absolutely true. Um, you know, the, the 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 key difference, you know, for the folks that are listening to this, the the the, the key difference here between solar and fossil fuels is is really this: fossil fuels are market based inputs to power production. In other words, coal, oil, natural gas, you name it, and they follow a market fluctuation model, right? There's there's sort of a, a break-even point of production, and you can fall below that. You are you are uh, the producer is 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 uh, is losing money. If they produce above that, they're making loads of money, and so we have this natural uh, commodities-based input of of you know oil, etc. And it's constantly in flux. Mm -hmm. What is very different about that when it comes to solar is that at least today it's silicon-based. It's technology-based, and just like chips have been decreasing in cost. Um, on, uh, uh, on, a, on a per unit basis and their power has been increasing, solar follows the same exact trajectory. It is a technology-based energy production. It is not fossil fuel-based. It is not tied to a particular market. So when you actually look at the production curve of solar, it is a straight sloped negative line, right? And it is just cratering and to your point and i say cratering the price the cost of production is is cratering or we can say it in a more positive way the efficiency is 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 increasing dramatically on a on a cost basis right the technology itself may not be becoming more efficient as fast as we want to but when we actually look at the cost of per unit to produce it it is falling rapidly and so that efficiency is going up and that's not going to stop just like moore's law has been true for the past 50 years um energy production via solar will continue to be the same and so when you look at it today in most places around the world, um, it's at par with coal and fallen below that pretty rapidly. So what has been the standard of energy production, which is to put up a, a, a quick, fast, cheap coal-fired power plant, those economics are being threatened and threatened greatly. And now it it is more of the argument today to put up a solar farm than to put up a coal-fired plant. And, and that, that the horse is out of the barn, um, that's not going to stop it's only going to increase. The very nice thing about all of this, of course, is that all of these panels, by the way, are connected by IoT. All of them are producing <laughs> massive amounts of data in yep. real time about where the production is. And, and you could, you know, some of these farms are in, in the, the size of square miles, right? They're, they're enormous. And just as a cloud comes over them, they can see one quadrant of the solar farm is going under, uh, is falling production. And you've still got high production. Another, and as that cloud passes over, you'll start to see that it'll ramp down and then ramp back up again. So the need to manage these solar panels and to uh, lightly, uh, you know, we, we, you call it a cold start, but what you don't want to do is to spike the grid. And so information and communication technologies or, or IOT, if you will, has to be part of this equation, has to be part of the solution to manage all of these, these massively growing uh, farms and the presence of solar panels in general. Interesting. I have a left field question for you on that then, Marcus. Uh, so one of the things that I've come across in, in a lot of these conversations with people is that the production of the data from whatever source often has left field applications. So uh, would it be possible, for example, for solar generators to start reselling their production data to weather companies as an would alternative be, revenue stream? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, I don't, I don't see why not. Um, if, if that, uh, you know, if there's something useful to it, uh, you know, we see a lot of these examples, right? There's sort of the, the, the the, the data itself might not be necessarily, quote unquote, useful for the company that is producing 
it, but yeah. it actually may be very useful as a derivative. Um, so it's a data derivative for another company that can produce some insights into it. So yeah, is is it is it possible? Absolutely. Are there are there uses for it? Uh, yes, today there are, and I I would suspect that they're going to continue to increase at at uh, you know at, at at some level. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's val- valuable data. Uh, I- a, a, a more a more related and relevant question. <laughs> I was just a left field one that occurred to me, but a more related and relevant question, I guess, is with the with the price of the renewables and as we said in particular solar falling so rapidly, and with no end in sight, are we ever going to hit a point where I, I shouldn't say ever are we going to hit a point and roughly when are we going to hit a point? It'll probably depend on geography when energy will be like broadband. Uh, you just sign up for a monthly fee, and you know you use you almost have an unlimited supply. Yeah, that's uh, that's a really interesting question, Tom. There's there's been talk about that. Um, really, there's there's been a lot of talk about that in terms of innovation of the regulated business model here in the United States. Um, do we do we still charge on a per kilowatt basis? In other words, you know, it's a metered usage, or do we do as you're talking about, as you you know, you sort of relate it to the broadband? Is is you know all you can eat type of uh, consumption? Um, I you know I I, I suspect we're going to be a little uh, maybe I say a little let's say um, I think. You know, if we compare it to broadband, um, I think at this particular point, we are probably not that close uh, to, to that vision. And and I, I think quite simply, this really comes down to infrastructure. Um, the infrastructure that's needed from a utility perspective to manage um, that kind of uh, production and to have stability in the grid is is an is an awfully expensive um, endeavor uh, for them to undertake. So I, I I think right now that that vision is is probably going to be f- a little bit off uh, again from infrastructure. But you know when we look at it from broadband, you know we we said the same thing. You know back in the you know back in the 70s and, and 80s when we started uh, really the 80s when we started to have commercial dial up for consumers, we thought you know when we had the what was it the 9.6 baud uh, modem <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, the modems and it would dial off, and and now today, uh-huh. God, we can get an entire you know two hour video in about you know a minute or two. Um, you know, I think if you if you look back, you know, twenty or thirty years ago, you'd scratch your head and go, how did we ever get here? So I I I suspect that we will see that future. Um, God, that's a crystal ball question about exactly when that's going to happen. And and so if if we look at it individually at a home. Um, as we were talking about earlier, you could have solar panels up, you could have a storage unit, and you could have, you know, theoretically limitless amounts of power at your disposal. When we look at it at a broader uh, centralized model, when it comes to the utility, there's a whole lot more infrastructure that needs to go, that needs to be put in place. So I, I, I think there's some impediments there. But but again, can we get there and will we get there? I suspect we will. When? That's a good question. What have you heard? What 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 what, 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 what have you heard? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'd I'd love to hear. I mean, you talk to a lot of prognosticators out there. Uh, yeah. What 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 are you hearing about this? Uh, well, possible. Uh, yeah, it it depends on where. I I think um, a lot of the stuff will come down to regulations, and you know we both know that the utilities industry is a heavily regulated industry. Uh, more so in some regions than others. Uh, you know, so, some places you've got regional monopolies, other places you've more liberalized markets. But in any case, the, 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 in, in some areas, you know, you have to apply to regulators to change, to change the pricing and it, it gets very, very complex. I, I don't know. And then you've got uh, companies who, you know, they, they have large generation systems that they have mm-hmm. to um, they have to pay off uh, over over decades. Um, whereas with newer people coming in, you know, just stick up a few solar farms, you don't have nearly the amount to pay off. It, you you have a very um, very skewed playing field uh, as a possibility. Uh, then you have the possibility of you know Elon Musk coming in because. He's aiming to sell half a million uh, electric cars cars a year by 2020, each with a 70 to 100 kilowatt hour battery, all of which will be constantly connected. 
Um, you know, we're talking IoT. These will be IoT endpoints. Uh, IoT endpoints with 70 to 100 kilowatt hours of storage. Uh, so you're looking at uh, what's that? Uh, that that's several. That's uh, what 50 50 gigawatt hours of storage per annum uh, connected. Uh, that that's a lot of um, that's a lot of virtual power plants right there. Yeah, that that, that, that certainly is. I uh, you know the the co the coordination is uh, is massive. Um, in other words, if you've got all of these roving mobile electric vehicles out there, and to take advantage of them, um, you need a, a a serious amount of coordination that that takes place on a on a large scale. Um, Almost and there's as complex as sending a rocket up into space and landing it back on a drone barge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, possibly, possibly even more complex now. <laughs> All right, this is not rocket science, but <laughs> yeah, but I, I think it's probably more akin to uh, synchronized swimming with a thousand swimmers in the pool than it is to sending a, a large uh, uh, carbon fiber object up into space. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're we're coming to the the end of our time, uh, Marcus. We're on the, the, the thirty minute mark. <clears throat> uh, before we go, if uh, if people are interested in in uh, talking more to you or finding out more about uh, about Marcus or about IDC or about uh, or about the utility industry or IoT, where do you reckon they should go? Where, where would you point people to? Yeah, they can they can visit uh, idc.com. Um, you know, my work involves uh, not just uh, issuing reports and and reports about the state of the industry, but we also have a community blog, um, IDC community blog that we uh, analysts provide their um, their thoughts on specific topics. So I, I think you, they could they could land within IDC itself, and um, I'm easily searchable and, and findable there. Super. Awesome. That's great. Marcus, thanks a million for coming on the show today. Yeah, Tom, thanks for having me. Nice speaking with you. You take care.